Hey, y'all. I'm Bud Elliott, and this is my College Football Summer School Series on Cover 3. I bring on the team experts from the 24-7 sports staff and ask them the questions I care about. No fluff. Which players will be toughest to replace? What position groups are sneakily better or worse than I realize? We get you the scoop on each team in 20 minutes or less. Let's go. Hey, guys. Welcome back in to Bud Elliott's Summer School. We talk everything college football. Today, we're going to get the rundown on Michigan State. And to do that, we're going to bring in Stephen Brooks, of Spartan Tailgate. Stephen, welcome back to the show, man. Happy to be here, man. Been looking forward to this all year. Last year was a great, great experience. So uh, happy to talk some ball. Happy to fill the void with with something sort of sort of real here, you know, as we as we tick away the days. We we need it. Um, so I gotta give Steven a lot of credit. He was probably like the most honest and accurate team site publisher that we had last year on this entire series, right? Like Michigan State's coming off. A Peach Bowl game where where they won what ten or eleven ball games in twenty twenty one, and he came out and he told us on the show, and my sources within the building told me how the heck did we just win that many games? Like they knew they were lucky, and I, I went back and I listened to all of last year's shows for these. I, I got to give you credit, man. You were really like open and honest about it, and I, I don't think anybody saw five and seven coming, but we knew based no. on there would be a step back. Yeah, no, I appreciate that. Uh, I, it's good to know I got something right for once, you know, blind squirrel nut, all that, you know, whatnot type of thing. Um, you know, they were just in people like you and I, but know, like you don't go from two wins in year one to 11 in year two of a coaching staff that just doesn't happen. And then you, what do you know? We see the last year's NFL season play out. And who's one of the best running backs in the league the second he walks in the door? Oh, that's that guy from Michigan State, right? So they, they, he was able to cover up. Quite a bit. Now, that wasn't everything, you know, to, to be fair, the guys that came back. Um, they had quite a few injuries last year, literally starting in game one. They lost their best D tackle, their best linebacker, their best DB, all within the first game to different uh, amounts of time. And then they really didn't get healthy until like mid, late October. And even then it was guys trying to come back and other guys had gotten hurt. Their depth wasn't there. Then uh, as you turn to November, they were dealing with the suspensions from the Michigan incident. So they were down eight defensive players there. Uh, had to play four D ends. I'm sorry, four D tackles uh, on, on their starting line down in Illinois. I ended up pulling off an upset down there with it. But it was an odd year. Uh, and, you know, I'm sure we're going to get into it. But I, I'm looking at a very similar sort of ceiling from what I described last year to sort of like, you know, I definitely make a bowl game, finish over 500. But it's not a team that I think is built to contend. It's just got to be a team that sort of maintains the trajectory of the whole big picture, I would say. I, I got to open – well, I guess we already opened it. I, I kind of had to continue to open with this. So, so like in a team that does have uh, a lot of transfers through Mel Tucker's first couple of years, and I think we hear this with any team that you know takes a lot of transfers. Team I'm very familiar with, Florida State did the same same thing. You have to ask culturally, like does does Mel Tucker still have this team? Like, did, did, are they still fighting for him, believing him? Does the coaching staff feel like they have the pulse of these guys? Oh, definitely, definitely. Um, because a lot of the, you know anybody who wasn't really on board with that has already been flushed out in some of these last couple off seasons or just made their way out on their own type of thing. But I do think they've done a good job of when they hunt the transfer portal, they are trying, they are getting, you know, you're not seeing them get the the Kyler Murray's, the Caleb Williams types. Yeah, of course they're both QBs, but I'm just saying the high profile dudes. You're really not seeing sure. them get them. You're seeing them get the second chance guys. Maybe the third chance guys, the guy who started at Juco, maybe this is his third or fourth. You know, he's getting the guys that are really like at the end of their rope kind of thing. And it's, they have no choice, you know, and he, he's kind of presenting that same sort of um, image in terms of I'm a, I'm a hungry coach. I'm trying to build this thing. You know, this is all going on my record now. I've been a long time assistant. I'm a head coach now. This is this is all up to me. You know, the buck stops here type of thing. So I think it, culturally they have done a pretty good job of getting transfers like that that are desperate to, to do something. And that, that molds pretty well, I think, with the culture he's tried to lay down from day one. And then the returning guys, I mean, now, this year especially, we're starting to see a lot of the 2022 class come up. The 21 class is the first one that was built over Zoom mostly. About half those guys are already gone, and a good chunk probably won't finish here, I would guess. But there's a couple of pretty good hits in there as well. They've, they've filtered up. 2022 class is filtering up to where those guys were sold on it from day one, right? And so it's like they – they already came here knowing what the culture was going to be. And, and, you know, they take pride in sort of trying to trying to solidify all of that. So um, I think I don't think that's an issue right now. I think it's just mostly a, uh, you know, these last couple of years other than 11 two, it's mostly been a talent thing. They haven't had the talent to compete at the top of the Big Ten and they haven't had the depth either where we really saw that last year 
um, in a big way with all those injuries and suspensions I mentioned. But even even the 11 and two year in 21, they, they, were, they were hanging by the razor's edge at, at certain positions at certain times. Then November came and guys were either hurt or tired. And that's when the losses came. You know, they went eight, eight, no, nine and no start. Everybody was healthy. They had, had really good luck there. And then November came not so much. And we started to see some of the cracks of the depth there. So that's really the state uh, of that right now. But in terms of Mel Tucker and culture and, and buying everything, I don't think that's an issue at all at this point. Nice. So Peyton Thorne, quarterback of an offense that was the top 60 offense, which is not great, but as we'll get to, wasn't as bad as the defense was. He leaves for Auburn. And normally I'm like, that's a kind of a step up for Michigan State, but also given how bad the quarterback room is at Auburn and the fact that I think Auburn's receivers are, are pretty sketchy uh, talent wise. That's not necessarily a guaranteed step up for him in terms of programming. How do you? What's your read on this? Was he going to be the starter at Michigan State? I, I kind of assume so, but is that wrong to assume? No, I don't think so. Um, I think you'd, you'd, your your money would be safest if you were to put, would have put it there. You know, from what I understand, coming out of spring practice, the communication was that that Peyton Dorn was still in the lead. He had not won the job; it was not over. They hadn't crowned him or anything like that. He was still going to have to compete with Noah Kim, a redshirt junior, who was his backup last year, and Caden Hauser, a redshirt freshman, who's you know, he, he's the uh, golden boy QB recruit of the Mel Tucker era so far, lead 11 guy, four-star kid out of St. John Bosco. Um, as Pull the public, that's who they want, you know, because he's got all the, the flashy credentials. But my understanding is internally the communication was that Peyton would still go into camp at least ahead, you know, in the number one position. Not that he was assured of anything, but but in the lead. And so, yeah, it's it's curious on a lot of different levels, you, you know, and we all we never know – every angle of transfer things because there's so many angles that can go into it you know um but i do think if he stayed here he would have had a very good chance uh to be the starter to hold those guys off some more but the the, the, the end of spring open practice he looked like the guy who was in front so uh you know you spin it the other way though if he was going to lose keon coleman who i think is you know going to be a household name this fall potentially depending on where he lands Jaden reed we just saw was a second round pick of the green bay packers Two NFL receivers out the door uh, trying to break in new guys, an offensive line that I don't think has instilled a lot of faith. He had no run game last year. So you could sort of, you, again, you, you twist it one way, you could see how it makes all the sense in the world to go find something new, especially if it's a situation where it's just sort of turnkey. You just got to show up and you're the guy. And on the other hand, you could see why, you know, there's benefits of staying and the continuity and, and trying to, you know, polish up your legacy and all that. The one thing that I have to know with Peyton is that after after that end of spring practice on April fifteenth, a couple weeks ago, um, it, he 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 opened up a little bit, not fully, but opened up a little bit about how injured he was last year. And there's a hit he took in game one against Western Michigan where he folded up and went down, had to leave, only left for a play, but it looked bad. Came back in, finished the game, but he said from that moment forward he wasn't right. Uh, and then there was something else later in the season where it was upper body and lower body at the same time. So. People can put as much weight as they want into all that. It's a guy who had a had a down year, you know, given some reasons for it. Are they reasons? Are they excuses? Are they both? I, I sort of leave that up to the court of public opinion. But I think it's at least it's definitely notable to say that uh, he was not fully 100 percent healthy last year. And that obviously just complicated so many other things. When you look at the lack of the running game, that didn't help him. Uh, Jaden Reed being hurt for a little bit and playing most of the year dinged up didn't help him. All sorts of other things. So there wasn't a lot really to feel good about <laughs> with the Michigan State offense last year, to boil it down to a sentence. For sure. So at least we, we wouldn't expect a, a large step back, if, if any at all, from, from either Kim or House or whoever, whoever wins that job. Probably not. Uh, I mean, it's 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 the, the allure of the unknown, right? But the thing is that those guys have 20 combined college passes under their belt. Um, Kim came in a couple times like that, a couple like one one play shifts for Thorne when he was getting evaluated and uh, threw a couple touchdowns, actually, you know, did a couple nice things. And he had a couple like end of game, you know, uh, bleed it out drives. How was I think had one series where he threw one pass, I want to say. Um, so just not a lot of experience. And that's one of the things with Peyton Thorne, you know, physically, he's not going to wow you at all. Um, you know, the physical tools and traits really are just kind of middle of the road for him. But cerebrally, you know, son of a coach, uh, grandson of a coach, you know, thinks the game very well. And they always would say that the consistent thing with Thorne was always that we trust him to get us in and out of the right things at the line of scrimmage. And we trust that he's seen the right things from the defense to, you know, uh, maneuver, pull the right switches and get us in the right spots. So that's where maybe if, even if both these guys, and it is plausible that both these guys are more 
physically talented than him just from a raw ability standpoint, but will they be able to match what he brought between the ears and the benefit that that gave the offense, sort of the unseen stuff that he was doing out there that, you know, again, the numbers aren't that great, so maybe it's maybe it's a wash, but that, that experience, that savvy of, of seeing and, and feeling and knowing when to check this or that uh, is really what's what they have to find out, whether they can replace that or not. All right, fill in the blank here. After losing Keon Coleman and Jaden Reed at receiver, that's 180 targets, 113 catches, 1,500 yards, and probably going to be two top 100 picks. The one guy already is. The next guy, if he stays healthy, got to be. Uh, if the if the drop-off at receiver is not quite as big as we think it's going to be, it's because who stepped up and played really well? Ooh, I, I think it's going to be a committee, honestly. I mean, not to duck it. Uh, Trey Mosley is their returning number two, so he sort of – Elevates to number one by default, of course, but but skill set wise, he's just he's a hand in glove number two, you know, because, again, he doesn't really wow you physically and everything, but you throw the ball his way. He's going to catch it. He might not shake a guy and break it off for 80, but he will catch it. He won't lose it. He'll go to the ground. First down. We live to play another down type of thing. You know, he's just very, very reliable, but not not explosive or or scary, you know, or dangerous necessarily in that way. That's what Keon Coleman was like and Jaden Reed, of course, in his own way. But. Keon, like, would, that, that's a guy that scares you. It's 6'4", 200, leaping ability, speed. Um, so I think it'll be a committee. Uh, we'll, we'll see what they get in the transfer portal, too. You know, the, that's that's bubbling as we speak right now. I do think there will be some transfers that come in. Maybe there's an alpha dog within that group that they can pull out. But I think it'll be more of a committee. You've got some sophomores coming up. Antonio Gates Jr., former four-star kid, top 247 kid, uh, who's there ready to blossom. Uh, Jerron Glover is in that class, a kid out of Florida, uh, Riverview, I believe it is, that they plucked yep. out of there. Um, and then Tyrell Henry was an in-state kid from Roseville uh, in that threesome of, of um, redshirt freshmen. That I think all of them are going to be in the mix. Montori Foster is an upperclassman who's been in and out as sort of a third, fourth swing guy the last couple of years. I just don't see a breakout a, as another star, though, honestly, but I do think it's going to have to be all of them cobbling it together a little bit. So last year, uh, you told me that the offensive line was a major concern for you, especially if they got dinged up. And the numbers were pretty bad. So, like, again, Michigan State fans, Spartan Tailgate knows what they are looking at and what they are writing about. Uh, do you expect improvement this year along the offensive line? I'm still in a see it to believe it state with that. I mean, I don't mean to, to be like overly down on them or anything. And I've been saying this like every year since I've got the job, you know, and I've been covering the team, but it's, it's mostly the same guys, right? You know, maybe there's, they really only lose one starter from last year. At this point, it could be five returning guys, you know, and the, the major addition that they got is a junior college uh, tackle Keyshawn Blackstock. He was our number one uh, junior college offensive lineman in the rankings major major recruiting win for them i think he could play guard or tackle it sounds like uh he's competing at left tackle right now with uh brandon baldwin who's a redshirt junior got a got a lot of run last year as basically a pseudo starter he started when when horse their number one wasn't there and he ended up starting like five six games maybe maybe a couple more than that so he's not gonna be easy to beat out but it's just all the same guys and i and i can't you know normally but i would say well they're, it's all the same guys but at least they're a year older a year stronger a year wiser but most of these guys are all multi-year starters too. You, so it's like, you can I, know they are. I, I can't in good faith just per, just assume natural progression anymore because I've been assuming that for this group for four or five years and it's, it remains a mediocre to average at best unit. Um, so in terms of this year, I don't know. I, I really don't think we'll probably see a night and day difference. Um, with the depth, at least, that will be different. You know, the, the Mel Tucker recruits, the Chris Kapilovic, your line coach, his recruits are, again, finally starting to, to filter up to the top a little bit. And those guys came in with, like, non-negotiable size. And that was one of the real main differences. You probably remember me saying this last year. At the end of the D'Antonio era, they just had five guards out there. You know, they had no real yeah. tackles on their roster. The recruiting and the development was not there in that room. And so now, you know, th these guys came in 6'6", 300, and they're starting to filter into that top, uh, into the two deep at least. So I think the future is bright because they brought in a lot of these big bodies with tools, with athleticism, guys that I hear are developing rapidly behind the scenes. Um, but right now they're still sort of at the end of that transition period of some holdover guys from the previous staff who are good, experienced, you know, reliable-ish, but not ready to turn the keys over fully to the young guys. Um, so in that case, I, I think it'll be about what we saw last year, quite honestly. I don't, I have no reason to believe at this point that it'll be a market improvement. 
Gotcha. All right, so last year the defense, uh, top 90, which is really a, a massive drop-off from what they were the prior year. Now, stylistically, my numbers say they were similar, right? Extreme bend but don't break. The problem is in 2021, they didn't break. In 2022, they did the bend but don't break thing, but then once the teams got into the red zone, they also didn't really resist any kind of red zone uh, effort by the opposing offense. Where are they most – like what area of this defense is most likely to improve in 2023? I think it's it's the front seven, um, just to get it right. You know, and I think that's the thing, Bud, that you, if this team is going to overachieve or be anything above sort of what I'm laying out for you guys here, I think it's because that front seven maybe is really good, you know. Um, not you know, nationally renowned or anything, but but in terms of the Big Ten, in terms of the division, that might be you know, they're the tip of their spear to, to make some, make a little noise. They're not going to be this dark horse contender, but if they're a little better than I think, I think it's that front seven. The D line has been remade through the transfer portal. Uh, they got two big tackles in there from um, Florida state and Liberty. Uh, the, the crown jewel jewel is a, is a big end to Nisha Adelier from yeah. Texas A&M was a four-star kid, very big time recruit out of Katy, Texas. Um, only played three games at AM and he comes over here and he says, I'm going to be playing everything from zero technique right over the nose all the way out to the nine. And that's that's fascinating to me. I mean, they haven't had a guy like that. If he can really do that and be effective, we'll see. But if he's really that type of guy that can play any position in there, never has to come off the field, can play the run, can be a difference maker on passing downs for you, that's really intriguing. They bring back almost all their linebackers except for Ben Van Sumer and uh the workout warrior, you know, who guys might have might have heard during draft season, um, didn't end up getting picked. But he was not a super productive or, or instinctual player anyway. He was more of a workout warrior. So in terms of production, proven football guys, Jacoby Winman coming back, he's a full-time linebacker now. He started those two games, weeks one and two last year, had like six sacks or whatever, and like three, four fumbles in two games, went crazy, and then was like never really heard from again. And then he moved back to linebacker. He'll just be a linebacker this year. Aaron Brule, a former Mississippi State transfer. He's a guy that I think has a lot of versatility, can play in the open space, uh, can give them something in pass coverage. Darius Snow was one of the who I mentioned early on, those week one injuries. He was a safety in 21, moved, bulked up, moved to linebacker. And he was really sort of the key to a lot of the things they were doing because of that DB background and just the, the, move, the ability he gave them in the middle of the field to cover some things up and be very physical, be a sure tackler at the same time. That really hurt them. He was the one who was out for the full year, um, and it was a, it was a bad injury. So I don't even know at this point what it looks like for him. I don't think he'll be available at the start of training camp. Um, if he is, he'd be very very limited, I would think. So, but all that to say, uh, I do. And their their tackles, they lose uh, Jacob Slade, who was very productive. But like I said, bringing those transfers who just have size that they didn't have before. Simeon Barrows, another undersized kid, uh, was a high school defensive end in Georgia, but he's like a He's like a sawed off sort of Geno Atkins penetrator there in the middle. He's, sure. he's a guy who's going to be interesting. So if I, I think the front seven has a chance to be their most dangerous unit and maybe it's something that can, you know, put a little bit of the team on their back in a certain way and, and be that difference making unit uh, week to week. So, all right, if the front seven is the most likely spot to get better, what's the least likely spot to be better? Strictly on defense, you're saying, yeah. or across the board? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, just on defense. It's, it's, yeah, it's got to be the secondary, um, and that's been a weakness, you know, since Mel Tucker's been here, uh, which is kind of surprising given, you know, his his background as a DB's coach. Uh, you know, 2021, they somehow won 11 games despite giving up more passing yards per game than any team in the country, any team. And then last year they were statistically a little bit better, uh, you know, anecdotally, not much at all, and they, they were dead last, I want to say, with two interceptions as a team. You know, that just that can't happen. Uh so there's been a turnover in personnel back there. I actually do think this group could be a little better, but, you know, when you look at the options, I do think they're, they're probably least likely, I guess, as well. But they've turned over a lot. That 2022 class I keep mentioning, Mel Tucker's first class that he didn't have to recruit over Zoom. Uh, those guys, they could have three starters in the, in the defensive backfield. Uh, Malik Spencer is a safety who they feel really, really good about uh, out of Georgia. It was a really good recruiting win, really good identification. Uh, got him in like March of that cycle and, and held on to him against, you know, Miami and some others who were trying to pick him off. Just a, a textbook modern box player who can drop back, play safety, come up to the line of scrimmage and anything in between. 
you know, he can do it all in the middle of the field there. I think he's going to have a really bright career. Uh, next to him is Jaden Mangum, is another sophomore from that class, four-star Michigan kid. He got a little bit of run last year with some of those injuries I mentioned about. Uh, and then Dylan Tatum is a guy who just came in as – he was a four-star Michigan recruit. Just came in as an athlete, sprinter type of guy, and, and nobody really knew, you know, was he a running back? Is he a DB? Literally played every position in the defensive backfield last year at different times. Strong, free, nickel, corner. Settled at nickel near the end. Got a start at the game in game 12 against Penn State. Looked pretty good. And now I think he's probably got the inside track to start uh, one of those positions. So it's young in the defensive backfield. That's where you worry. You know, have they seen everything? Are they communicating the right way? All those type of things. But they're also there's upside. There's room to grow, I guess, if you want to spin it that way. And they are all really good athletes. These are all four-star type of caliber kids coming in. So they have that pedigree of at least – a higher level of, of, of athleticism, bigger builds, an inch or two there, you know, a second or two there on the times, you know how much that can make a difference. Absolutely. Uh, Stephen, wh where would you say is the position group that has the biggest drop off from starters to the backups? Uh, again, just defense or the whole team? The uh, whole team. We'll, we'll go the whole team for this one. Starters and backups. Um, safety, for sure. Safety for sure, actually. Yeah, not to just carry on with what I was just saying, but yeah, it's safety for sure. And they have, uh, as of this taping, they've picked up one transfer safety, a kid named Amorian Smith from Cincinnati, who was sort of a backup special teamer over there. I think he'll probably be the exact same thing here for now. Uh, In-state kid from the Detroit area, somebody who actually were sniffing around really, really hard at the end of the 21 cycle, and he had already been committed to Cincinnati and stuck with it. But uh, they bring him back home. I think he's exactly what they needed. Just they needed some depth there. I don't think they really need, you know, if you could get, look, we all know, you can get a, an all-league player, plug him as a starter, of course. That's just not super realistic. I think in, in terms of the real world, he was exactly what they needed. Just as a guy who's young, played a little bit, though, knows a little bit about what he's doing from the area, so he's not going to be looking to bolt necessarily. They just need some bodies behind those two guys, uh, Mangum and Spencer, that I mentioned, because they really had basically no functional depth. I mean, you're talking about guys who are either walk-ons or way, 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 way undersized or moving out of position. Uh, if one of those two were to go down. Now they at least have a third in there that I think gives them a little bit. It's still the it's still the thinnest on the team, though. And I don't know if you want, like I said, both of them being second-year guys. Uh, Spencer redshirted, but uh, Mangum didn't, so he's a true sophomore. You, to me, I think you kind of want those guys growing together as a tandem and seeing where they can take it together. Um, so even if you had, you know, the, the plug-and-play starter in your, in your pocket, I, of course you take them, but – I, I could I could make an argument of why it'd be good to just let the young guys sort of take the wheel themselves and figure it out as well. But in terms of depth and where they're really danger where they're dangerously thin, it's it's those two spots for sure. So the West draw for Michigan State, which is the East team, I guess this may be the last year with divisions. We'll, we'll have to see. Uh, at Iowa, at Minnesota, host Nebraska, and you get Washington in the non conference. So with that as the groundwork, and obviously the East is is the East, and it, it's almost always a bear. In your mind, what are the three most likely records Michigan State might finish with this year? Most likely? Okay. Uh, probably just – it's easiest for me to just pick it like so. Five wins, six wins, seven wins probably are the three most sure. likely. Eight, I think, eight and four would be uh, like all systems go, you know, all the question marks were checked and health was 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 pristine for the most part. Um I don't think five and seven on the low end. I don't think that would necessarily be a, you know, total meltdown disaster. Could get worse than that. But I think five and seven, if you hey, if Matt Rule and those guys are all put together in year one, and that's a tougher game than we think. Obviously, going to Kinnick that you mentioned is never easy. Um, some of these games that you think are toss ups or winnable, depending on your persuasion, maybe they're not. So yeah, I think five, six, or seven wins are the three most likely for sure. Uh, like I said, above that would would feel like overachieving or maximizing at least what they are and. I do think there's scenarios where it's lower than that. Awesome. Stephen Brooks, Spartan Tilgate. This has been Bud Elliott, College Football Summer School here on the Cover 3 Podcast, and really appreciate the time. Thanks for having me, man. Always a good time.